Good morning, church. Good morning. Well, I want to welcome you all here this morning, and not just the regulars here, I always welcome you, but we've got so many visitors here, and I can't remember them all, but I know there's uh, Russ and uh, Jan over there. Welcome. Where's Mark? Mark? I can remember his name because it happens to be my brother, so that makes it a lot easier. But I want to welcome, if you haven't spoken to him, he seems like a really nice guy, so don't let him go without meeting him this morning. Um, Kurt and Kim over here, and we have Steve and Alice, and was there any others that I missed this morning? Raynell? Yeah, Raynell in the back, back yes. Here. And what, what's your name? Ben and Dave. Ben and Dave? Ben and Dave. Ben and Dave. Ben and Dave. Ben and Dave. They've been here before. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was going to say. Okay. Oh, of course, we have Dan Fredericks this morning. His wife, Julie, isn't able to be here this morning with us. He's, she's got some family matters to deal with, but we, we thank uh, Dan for traveling out here this morning and sharing some time with us behind the pulpit. So you're welcome. Um, other announcements? We have a shared meal after the morning service. There is usually plenty of food, so if you haven't brought anything, that's okay. You're more than welcome to spend some time in fellowship downstairs following this morning service. Evening service at 6 o'clock this evening. We're going to be continuing the series on what is the church, and we're dealing with the, with the membership of the church and what, about, what that involves. Wednesday, 6 Downstairs, we have time for prayer. Definitely want to encourage you. We spend some time singing praises and needs and concerns, turning them over to the Lord. That's Wednesday night at 6. Thursday at 9.30 in the morning, we have men and women's Bible studies, upstairs and downstairs. Um, men are upstairs, women are downstairs, so that's 9.30 on Thursday. Um, looking forward to next Sunday, Tim Cholly will be here as well. We look forward to his time with us. And just to pay particular note of, uh, next Sunday evening we'll be having Wade Hammond here. He's been here a number of times before. It's a, it's a wonderful time. He shares music and the gospel with us. So that's at 6 o'clock next Sunday, the 4th, I believe. So tell your friends and everyone that you can, that uh, he's, he, we can come here and just rejoice and worship the Lord in that manner. Also, just wanted to make note, just to save uh, data, um, Joe and Kelsey are going to be getting married. Yay, I heard a few Whoa. yays. <laughs> save, save the date, they'll be more involved with that, but that's June 4th, so, so put that down in your calendars. As uh, they are going to get married. I believe that's all I have for the announcements this morning. Let's stand, join in with Come Christians, Join to Sing. It's hymn number 64 if you're following along.
Good morning. Scripture reading for this morning will be out of Job 28. Surely there is a mine for silver and a place for gold that they refine. Iron is taken out of the earth and copper is smelt from the ore. Man puts an end to darkness and searches out the farthest limit, the ore in gloom and deep darkness. He opens shafts in a valley away from where anyone lives. They are forgotten by travelers. They hang in the air. Far away from mankind, they swing to and fro. As for the earth, out of it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up as by fire. Its stones are the palace of sapphires, and it has dust of gold. That path no bird of prey knows, and the falcon's eye has not seen it. The proud beasts have not trodden it. The lion has not passed over it. Man puts his hand to the flinty rock and overturns mountains by the roots. He cuts out channels in the rocks, and his eyes see every precious thing. He dams up the stream so that they do not trickle, and the thing that is hidden he brings out to light. But where shall wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its worth, and is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me, and the sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be bought for gold, and silver cannot be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued as the gold of Ophir, its precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. From where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. God understands the way to it and he knows its place for he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out. He said to man, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, wise Father, we come before you to worship you, to stand in reverence, to stand in awe of you, your wisdom, your mighty, your worth. Let us have clear minds, let us have clear hearts as we stand before you in worship to sing your praises, uh, to hear from your word. We know that sometimes our uh, devotions to you, they can uh, be lazy, uh, they can be uh, not thought out, sometimes they cannot even be sincere. But let us be sincere this morning, Father. Uh, use the Holy Spirit to strengthen our hearts, to strengthen our faith as we come before you to worship you corporately, uh, to be unified as you have called us to, uh, to in unison worship you. Please, Lord, give us wisdom uh, for all of our days, um, but one day at a time. We lean on you this day, uh, that as we uh, worship you and hear from your word, uh, that we may gain uh, the wisdom that you give to us by your spirit, uh, that we may love you with a full, uh, sincere uh, heart, and that we may have a true and abiding faith through your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Mark of a true believer is that we put our faith in Jesus Christ. That works its way out as trusting Jesus in every respect, every way. Trusting Jesus. That is all. Simply trust. Jesus, that is all. Trusting. 
declares, if you will, God's creation gift, testimony and praise to our Lord, the Lord of all creation. All heaven declares the glory of the risen Lord. sins and the penalty for that. I am forgiven. is done for us. Let's stand with this next one. Familiar words. It's 
Speaking of the wondrous cross. Well, good morning. It's a joy to be here, and uh, thank you for coming. And I understand several visitors, new persons uh, a little bit, and uh, so that's a joy. Uh, You are a blessing to me, and it's a privilege to be able to uh, come here from time to time and uh, continue to fervently pray for you as uh, as a fellowship. And it's always a joy to to come because I know you love the Word, and it's uh, a great joy to spend time in the Scriptures. Julie is not with me, as uh, was mentioned. She's caring for her folks in Nebraska. I appreciate your prayers for her. And um, her dad is 93 to be 94, and her mom's close to 90. I think she'll be 90 this coming year. And uh, they just have some um, age-related issues. They're living 
on their own for the most part, but, but need some care. So between Julie and, and her sister, they, they share time uh, going over to Nebraska and spending time with them. So those of you who have experienced that uh, sort of season of life and time of care for aging parents, you can understand that. But it's a blessing. It's a joy. And uh, we're just grateful for God's faithfulness and goodness in all seasons of life. And uh, so I trust today that you'll be encouraged in the word. I know you already are by the fellowship. It's such a sweet, sweet fellowship here at uh, Bethany Bible Church. And I'm always encouraged to be able to be here. It counted a, a tremendous privilege uh, to be able to bring forth the word um, as you've been so faithfully taught for so many years here. Um, we're going to be in the book of uh, Proverbs this morning, Proverbs chapter 8, and I, I debated, I, I have a brochure, I know you have a, a brief outline, but um, I only have uh, 30 copies of this, but I think there's probably enough, one for each couple or, or individual, so get a couple guys maybe to come and, and pass these out for me. I was, I was just going to preach and then just make these available at the end of the, end of the service, but in case you get bored during the message, you know, and you need something to tinker with, doodle on, uh, feel free to, to do that. Proverbs chapter 8, we'll be speaking this morning about wisdom's cry. Um, I don't know how much you have spent time in Proverbs. I'm actually wearing my Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tie this morning. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. It's a great truth. That has never failed. Um, and I'm sure there are other places in the, in the book of Proverbs that you, that you love, and you have maybe have them on a placard, or you've written them in your Bible. In that particular verse... Um, I can't remember receiving something from my parents where they didn't tack that in there, and my grandparents before them, so it sort of was drilled into my heart and my mind. And uh, they are precious, precious truths, certainly, of God's Word. Um, but this morning, as we look at Proverbs chapter 8, um, there's a couple things that I trust will, will drive you to the book of Proverbs in a, in a more comprehensive fashion more comprehensive fashion. Um, we are living in a world that is desperately in need of wisdom. Not human ideology. There's enough of that. Human wisdom. And as Joe read from Job chapter 28 this morning, we discover that the wisdom that is available to us as believers is not found here on this earth. You won't find it in, in any institution that you can go to. No matter what your degree may be in higher education, if you've been privileged to, to so follow that path or in normal courses of, of life, other areas of knowledge and attaining information. For the believer, we have a unique body of truth called wisdom. And wisdom cries out to us that we would know that truth, that we would order our lives around the wisdom that God makes available to us in his word. As Job records, wisdom is something that is like a, a, a precious jewel that's in a, that's in a, 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 a deep of mind that has to be dug out with great effort and determination and diligence. That's how you get wisdom. You don't casually read it in a book. You don't casually sit around and have discussions about what is wisdom with the philosophers, Plato and Socrates and, and that form of wisdom. The wisdom that God provides for us is unique. It's valuable. It is, in fact, eternal. And so my heart's desire this morning is that, that through the message this morning, and I'm only going to be able to scratch the surface, but I'm going to attempt to draw your attention to the wisdom of God, to hear the heart cry of wisdom, 
Wisdom calls out to us. Wisdom calls out to us not only in the, the confines of a church service. Wisdom cries out in application in the, in the city gates. It wants to express herself to the world, to families, to institutions, to governments, to all of society, to every culture. It cries out and says, listen to me. Because when you find me, every aspect of your life will be bettered will be straightened out, will be corrected, will be untangled, will instill within you a, a sense of confidence and hope and assurance and stability that can come only from God, what he has revealed from heaven to us, that body of truth that is called wisdom. Wisdom is not an academic exercise. Wisdom is a tactical weapon against ideologies. It is a warfare tool available to us. I'm not sure how many of these cross-references we will, we will get to this morning, but one of the things that, that Scripture tells us in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, is that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but spiritual. And that it is the word of God by which we are taking every thought captive to the what? The obedience of Christ. We are tearing down, we are attacking, we are, we are at war with every other thought and mindful that is contrary to the mind of God. Sadly, we tend to elevate the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God. They are mutually exclusive. And so it is wisdom that we are seeking. Wisdom is a practical resource for us. The book of James, which we'll look at later, I think at the end of the message, if I don't lose track of that, but James begins, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And God promises he will not withhold it. That's the starting point. We need wisdom for everyday life. There are many things that are confusing, perplexing, worrisome to us. Life rushes in unexpectedly, and it shakes us to our core. How do we make sense of it? We make sense of it because when our hearts and minds are oriented around the truth of God, the wisdom of God, then we understand everything correctly, properly. That is one of the benefits of the grace that we have in Christ. We are no longer dependent upon our own rationality. We are not dependent anymore on what people think and advise us with. We have the very word and mind of God in his word. Sadly, it's, it's often neglected. There's two things before we get into the message, and all this just by way of introduction before we get into Proverbs chapter 8. But there is a spiritual warfare, as I've mentioned already, between truth and error, between the truth of God and the lies and the deception of the evil one that is twisted into the very fabric of our culture in the heart of every individual who is outside of Christ. It is a warfare against the true righteousness that God provides uniquely and solely through Christ and the religious idolatry that the world offers in substitute for that. Anything that is not of the righteousness of God is pure idolatry. Whether it be paganism in the, the most remote jungles or, or remote areas of the most pagan and isolated people or those that, that, that follow their religion faithfully, it's all idolatry. It's all a lie. It's all deception. It's all confusion until we come to Christ and find true righteousness in him, the absolute forgiveness of sins, the correction of our heart and mind to be able to follow 
and obey and know the joy of the one true living God through Christ. We are in wisdom wars. That's what we are confronting every day of our life. The initiation of wisdom wars we find early on in the book of, of, the, of, of the scriptures in Genesis chapter 3. Let's just turn there. As we orient ourselves around how long this wisdom war has actually gone on. It's gone on since the fall of mankind. You will notice that God delivered to Adam and Eve, to Adam specifically, and thereby to Eve, how they ought to order and live their lives. And he delineates that, God delineates all of that in Genesis chapter 2. And he expresses to them the truth. And he shares with them some very basic truth, basically to obey him, a very simple command, verse 16 of chapter 2, the Lord commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Indeed, it was a test for mankind in his, in his state of innocence, in his state of absolute perfection before the Lord in the Garden of Eden. The test was, would he continue to follow that, that wisdom, that trust the Lord? It doesn't call it wisdom here. However, when we get into chapter 3, we certainly see here the, the twisting, the manipulation, the distorting occur, and we're familiar with it, but, but just for the sake of review, Genesis chapter 3 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, for from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Now, if you're familiar with the text we looked previously, she distorted that text of scripture, if you recall. Trick number one, craftiness number one. Number two, verse four, then the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Use a little bit of your own initiative. Use a little bit of your own mind. God really doesn't mean what he says. Seems pretty unreasonable, illogical. So, Knowing better than God, Satan continues to attempt to re-instruct Eve when he says, for God knows that in the day which you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So as the woman contemplated this new bit of information, this different wisdom source, this different perspective, she saw she saw that it was good for food. That it was a delight to the eyes. And that the tree was desirable to make one what? Wise. She took from its fruit and ate, gave also to her husband with her and he ate. The eyes of all, both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves, loin coverings. Yeah, they had a new body of information for sure, but it was deception. And the same allurement comes to our hearts and our minds every day. Every time we read an article, every time we watch a newscast, any time we are entertaining ourselves with even what may seem to be a benign source of just relaxing and enjoying a movie, perhaps. By the way, I'm not, I'm not teaching against movies or going to movies, okay? It's, that's not where I'm going. I'm saying that very skillfully and craftily, um, new forms and thoughts are implanted into our hearts and our minds through the eye gate, through the ear gate, reaching down into the heart gate. We could spend a whole lot of time today, and I'm not going to reiterate any of that stuff because 
want to focus on the word, but we know well enough, as we have seen what's going on in our culture, the kinds of foolishness that is being embraced by our culture. This is why wisdom cries to us. Because it has so permeated every aspect of our life. And so by God's grace, he calls us back to himself. He calls, back, calls us back to himself to learn his wisdom, his truth, to order our lives according to, to his revelation, the body of scriptures, and by so doing, rejecting, pushing back those other ideologies and thoughts that would want to impose themselves upon our own hearts and our minds. So it, is, so it is a battle. So then we have, with the initiation of this wisdom war in Genesis chapter 3, we have the ongoing entanglements of wisdom war. We read one of them this morning in Job. Job's friends came along to him, and they were giving all kinds of information. And Job didn't even understand all of it perfectly, but to his credit in Job chapter 28, as we read this morning, he knew where the true source of wisdom came from. And he knew that it wasn't from the interaction of human intellect, but it was from the very mind of God himself, and it was a resource that, that God and God alone has provided for us. But it was, though readily available and in abundance, it required hard work. It required a commitment. It required a focus on God, a love for him, and a fear of him. And with that setting the tone for our heart and our mind, then we pursue that body of information, we dig for it, we search for it, we purpose ourselves, not because it's easy, but because it is hard, because it is difficult, but because it is so valuable and it's so essential for us. Daniel, if we took the time to look at the book of Daniel, we would say, as Daniel found himself in Babylon, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's food. And it wasn't a matter of food. It was a matter of the wisdom of God. And so we see that God's blessing in the life of Daniel is that he gave him knowledge and wisdom above all the other wise persons and young men in Babylon. Daniel sought wisdom, and Daniel made it clear to Nebuchadnezzar that wisdom did not come from him, but it came from God, as you'll recall as he had to interpret the dream from Nebuchadnezzar. We might go there. We're not going to take, take time to go into that, just by way of illustration. Solomon, Solomon, who writes these books here for us, um, Proverbs, and many, 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 many more. The wisest man that ever lived by acknowledgement of the scriptures themselves, but also became one of the most foolish men as he accumulated among himself many, many wives and concubines. And it was that thing, that undiscipline of his own heart, that caused him to be able to worship, begin to worship other gods. How is it we can go from being so wise to being so foolish? We become enamored with our own resources and our own accomplishments. And that was a downfall of Solomon, as we know. And yet God was faithful even to the kingdom because of his eternal commitment to the kingdom that eventually the king of kings and the lord of lords would come and set up. The kingdom of David fulfilled in the kingdom of the king of kings and lord of lords. Indeed, as I said, spiritual warfare is taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. And Jesus himself, we are told, that he, as a young man, grew in wisdom and stature and the favor with God and men. Look it up, Luke chapter 2, verse 52. It was the pattern for young Jewish boys to learn the book of Proverbs, the writings of, of, of the wisdom literature, so that their lives could be shaped around a body of truth, so that not just by knowledge, but by the character of their own heart, they would purpose in their heart, like Daniel did, not to defile themselves, but to have their hearts and their minds centered on true truth, on true wisdom, which was found alone 
in God's provision of his revelation to us. And so then we are called to seek that wisdom. Wisdom literature was the basic curriculum for training young men. And indeed, training all children. So as we come to the book of Proverbs this morning, we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 8. But as we come to Proverbs chapter 8, I want to set a context for you. Why Proverbs chapter 8? Well, Proverbs is a systematic study in the development of moral character. And so Solomon writes for us the importance of instructing the mind and the heart, specifically from a father to a son, that not only would the son live a life that is worthy and honorable and one of integrity, but because by the very nature of that responsibility, he would lead his family, and he would lead his people, and he would lead his business, and he would lead his nation with a life well saturated in the wisdom from above rather than the deceptive wisdom from below. So building the case, look at Proverbs chapter 1 with me. Proverbs chapter 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the saying of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity. By the way, that's not DEI equity. This is just. This is right. This is what is honorable. This is properly assessing all things. To give prudence. That's good discernment, making decisions to the naive, to the youth, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear an increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So there's the contrast. The fear of the Lord brings true knowledge, it brings wisdom. But fools despise it, they reject it, they laugh at it, they scorn it. And so the father to the son says in verse 8, Hear, my son, your father's instructions, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like shoal, even whole as those who go down to the pit. We will find all kinds of precious wealth. We will fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us, and we shall all have one purse. My son, do not walk away with them. Keep your feet from their path. So then we find in verse 20, wisdom shouts in the streets. She lifts her voice in the square. She is calling out. There's nothing more practical in life than wisdom's application in the everyday areas of life. She's in the streets. She's in the realm of commerce. She's in your neighborhood. She's in your school system. She's in where you do business. She's in your comings and your goings. That's where wisdom is. That is the setting for the applied wisdom of God. But the streets have abandoned it. The framework of our culture has abandoned it. But it wasn't enough for Solomon to teach these truths to his son that he would understand them. He wanted it to get down to his heart. So chapter 2 of the book of Proverbs says this. My son, if you receive my words, he's taking it to the next level. He's instructed him. They've gone through the manual. They've gone through the class. But we've got to get to the heart.
My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commandments, where? Within you. Make your ear attentive to wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. So, if we had time, but we don't, but if we had time, we'd work our way through Proverbs chapter 1 through 9. And that's a tutorial for what it means to build within the heart of our young people moral character of the righteous sort. The way God has designed us to be, the way God has provided for us to be through the forgiveness of sins in Christ and to have the, 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 the resource of his truth. So going through Proverbs chapter 1 through 6, then we come to Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7 is all about the warning of the young men in light of the, the wiles of the harlot, the wicked woman, woman who entices, the woman who manipulates, the one who, who has a form of wisdom but is no wisdom at all but is really deception. So in all of her deception, she seeks to pull that young man away from the wisdom of God, enticing him in his naivete, in his foolish heart, to coax him her way. So Solomon says in verse 24 of chapter 7, Now therefore, my sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many are the victims she has cast down, and numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way of shoal, of death, of separation from God. Descending to the chambers of death. So, that's the context of Proverbs chapter 8. What does chapter 8 do? It's a beckoning call. She's urging us. She's not, she's not a weepy mommy. She is, she is wisdom here. She is speaking truth. She is declaring to us that which is essential for not only an ordered life personally, but the order of my life is essential to every area that my life touches. It's not an option. It's not I live one way at school and one way at church and one way at work and one way at church or One way in my business, I order it one way, and then at church a different way. It's not. The wisdom of God is all encompassing. This is the cart cry of wisdom. And so she says, if you have an outline in your bulletin, she beseeches us, part one, the cry of wisdom, verses 1 through 11. The conviction of wisdom, verses 12 through 21. The creator of wisdom, verses 22 through 31. And then fourthly of all, the concern of wisdom, verses 32 through 36. So this is what I want us to see this morning. It's just here, Proverbs chapter 8. And we see the intensity of it. We would see, in some regards, the practicality of it, but even more than just being practical, it's essential. Essential to every area of our life that we would live and we would exemplify wisdom in all that we do. It would be the 
informing resource for us, it would also be the restraining resource for us. That we would have good sense, that we would make wise decisions, that we would uphold standards that are fixed by God himself and not to be altered. This is wisdom. This is wisdom. So, let's break it apart here just a little bit as we uh, go to the text. Does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice? It does. It's a beckoning. I call it the beckoning, the beckoning call. It's an, it's an urging. It's, a, it's an urging from, from concern. It's an urging of of preservation. It's an urging that these things must be and certain things must not stand. She takes her stand. She is uncompromising with the standards of the Lord in every every way. By the way, there's many words that are also um, translated that are aspects of wisdom. They are attributes of wisdom. Wisdom, for example... You'll read often in Proverbs, understanding and discerning and sensibility, knowledge. Um, you will see the word uh, to be a well-crafted expert, shrewd, discretion, discipline. It's a tool for moral coaching, to have good sense, to be discreet. All of those words that we will see in the the text of Scripture are all components of of wisdom. So wisdom is multidimensional. That's why it has such wide impact in all areas. Well, wisdom calls on the top of the heights beside the way, verse 2, Where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gates that open to the city, at the entrance of doors, she cries out, To you, O men, I call, she says. And my voice is to the sons of men. O naive ones, understand prudence. And O foolish, understand wisdom. The city gates of the gates of a city, the gates were a place of one security. It's important for the city to be encompassed, but in order to go in and out of the city, you had to pass through the gate. The gate was a place also of commerce. The gate was the place where, where judgments were rendered. It was even the courthouse. So the gates of the city were all of that. Some were let in and some were not. Decisions of great weight were decided there. Contracts were signed in the city gate, so all would see and understand, and there would be witnesses to the case. But everything would be above board. Nothing could be done on the sly. They were done in the city gates. Integrity, honesty, openness, in all areas of human commerce going back and forth. So that's what she's crying out for. Wisdom calls. Wisdom calls. You see the voice of wisdom in verse 1. We see the vicinities of wisdom, which is the city gates. We see the virtue of wisdom as she cries out in verses 4 through 8, really. We'll see the validation of this wisdom as she cries out, verses 9 through 9 through 10, take my instruction, do not, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is better than jewels, and all the desirable things cannot compare with her. We spend so much money, so much time accumulating and accumulating and building our wealth when we often fail to build wisdom, which is the most valuable of all. Not that wealth isn't important, it's a very practical thing, but the ability to handle it wisely comes from the wisdom of God. So wisdom cries for these things. 
Secondly of all, then, beginning in verse 12, we see that there is the conviction of wisdom. I, wisdom, as she begins to define herself here, she says, verses 12 through 16, 16, I dwell with prudence and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance in the evil way and the perverted mouth, I hate strong words. The contrast between the nature of wisdom of the word and the wisdom of the world is as much as the opposites of love and hate. We are to be repulsed by the sin that creeps into our life and even takes control over certain areas. We need to have a healthy hatred for sin, recognizing it, and and bring it to a close. She says, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding, power is mine. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who judge rightly. I love those who love me. And those who diligently seek me will find me. She's not elusive. But she is valuable. And she must be sought in the right place. But once sought there, she is found. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even pure gold, and my yield better than choice of silver. I walk in the way of righteousness and in the midst of the paths of justice to endow those who love me with wealth that I may fill their treasuries. Recalls a time when Solomon, I'm sure, no doubt, thinking in his mind perhaps that when he was entrusted with the responsibility of being king over Israel, he said, Lord, I want wisdom, not riches. The Lord said, because you have not asked for riches, I will give you wisdom. And on top of the wisdom, I will make you rich. But everything was in its proper place. Wisdom in the word first then follows the wealth that is the, is the byproduct of such seeking. It is a very characteristic of the word of God itself, is it not? Let's look at um, Psalm 19 quickly. Psalm 19. I'm mindful of the nature of the scriptures themselves which is true of all of Psalm 119, but it is the the nature of the works and the word of God that it is by the word that the heavens were created. It goes back to creation. Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God in their expanses, declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speed, and night to night reveals knowledge, and on it goes. But... To know God in a specific personal way, we take in his personal revelation to us, composed in the scriptures themselves. Verse 7 then says, For the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned in keeping them. There is great reward. The response then and the benefit of that then is, Lord, keep me from the unwise things and examine my own heart. Verse 14 then, let The words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So the wise man is the man who focuses and orientates his life singularly on the Lord. Then the other benefits flow out of that relationship. This is the heart cry of wisdom that we would know and practice that. The third thing we see in this text of scripture in Proverbs chapter 3 is is the eternality, the eternality of this wisdom. It's been around since the beginning of time. It predates time. This wisdom is 
is the very mind of God. Notice what wisdom says. Wisdom says that she was possessed at the beginning of his way before the works of old. From everlasting I was established from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled and before the hills, I was brought forth. While I had not yet made the earth and the fields, while he, while he had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the dust of the, of, the, uh, of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above and the springs of the deep became fixed. When he set for the sea its boundary so that the water would not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master workman and I was daily in his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. Everything we see in the created order marks the wisdom of God. It's so good that the sun comes up every morning. <laughs> it's so good that with every sunrise, God's mercies are new every morning. All of that is the wisdom of God. He is so wise to keep the oceans where they belong and the earth where we can live. That is the wisdom of God. We're told in Proverbs chapter 3 that, in fact, by the, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth, chapter 3, verse 19. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps were broken up and the skies drip with dew. My son, let them not vanish from your sight. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, so they will be life to your soul and adornment to your neck. See, wisdom is all-encompassing. Working with Native American people, they get wisdom from created things, wisdom from the sun, wisdom from the moon, wisdom from the animals. There's no wisdom there. The wisdom that we have as believers predates anything we see in the created order. That's the wisdom that the Lord makes available to us. It's as eternal as he is. It is an attribute of God himself. It is, it is what Christ demonstrated for us. For in Christ dwells all the wisdom and the knowledge of God, Paul tells the Corinthians. So verse 32, we come to the fourth section then here, and we have the concern the concern of wisdom, and this is the application for us. Paul told the Corinthian believers that the wisdom of God is foolish with men. And that Christ himself is the wisdom and the power of God unto salvation. We're also told later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that because of Christ and what we have in him, we actually have the mind of Christ, which is wisdom. Wisdom dwells in him. So our source of wisdom comes through a personal relationship through Jesus Christ as our Savior. We stand in his righteousness and his righteousness alone. And so we pursue that wisdom through Christ. It's available to us. We must pursue it. So wisdom says in conclusion here, verse 32, now therefore, now therefore, O sons, listen to me. There will be three accounts here where we will see wisdom cry out and say, listen, listen, listen. This great crescendo from wisdom crying out to us. Blessed are they who keep my ways. Listen to that. Verse 33, heed instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my doorposts. For he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. 
grace upon grace upon grace of the benefits that we have in this great beatitude. Blessed is the man who listens to me. However, the warning, verse 36, but he who sins against me injures himself. You see, by rejecting the wisdom of God, we order our own self-destruction. We cannot survive apart from the wisdom of God. Those who hate me love death. That's kind of depressing. But such is the nature of the cry of wisdom for us. Let me close by tying this in to James. This will be, this will be quick. But James, the wisdom book of the New Testament, reminds us of these very principles only in a very succinct, a very succinct way. Hebrews chapter 3 outlines for us, in contrast, the wisdom of the world and wisdom of God. Wisdom of above and wisdom from below. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18 says this. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. See, wisdom is gentle in that it's, it's circumspect. It, it, it restrains itself. It doesn't force itself. It isn't, isn't full of pride and arrogance. It is wise. It is stable. It is gentle. But, James says, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But, verse 17, the wisdom from above, that which is the wisdom that is embodied in the mind of God and revealed to us in Christ, and in his word, that wisdom is characterized by these qualities, these attributes. First, the wisdom from above is, is pure, that is, is without defilement. It's peaceable, it's ironic, it is gentle, it is reasonable, it is full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seeds of those, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness, is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is the longing of our hearts. This is the longing of the cry of wisdom. That we would be characterized, that we would know the benefits of the wisdom that comes from above. Rather than being ravaged and manipulated and destroyed by the wisdom from below. So apply your hearts to wisdom. Study the book of Proverbs often. And realize that it's not just a compilation of nice sayings that they can post on a tie. I like this tie. But it's a whole guiding manual of developing our character. And so from chapter 10 on through the rest of the book, you have all those great sections of wisdom for application. Father, thank you for the time and your word. Thank you for the patience of your people. Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God has done a work through the word of God this morning to reinvigorate our enthusiasm, our, our drive to apply wisdom, wisdom that comes from you in all areas of our life, which has eternal benefit for our walk with Christ. For it is by wisdom that we are taught the word of God that reveals truth unto salvation. Paul wrote to Timothy. 
And as we walk in that wisdom, every area of our life will be benefited. And Lord, as you, as you catapult us, as you disperse us from this place, our families, our community, our city, every aspect of our culture needs wisdom from above. And we possess it through Christ. Lord, help us to be faithful with this. Thank you for your exceeding patience with us. Thank you for your unfailing love for us. And thank you that one day we will be complete when we see Christ. As he comes, we will see him. And then we will be like him. Lord, may that be the longing of our heart, the aspiration of our soul. Lord, we thank you for teaching us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 446, I'd Rather Have Jesus. Man in his fallen nature, of course, would not seek Christ. They would look for fulfillment in everything else. Even if they do obtain it, if they do not have Jesus Christ, they end up with nothing except judgment. But if you have Christ in your life, you have everything that you need. Let's stand with, I'd rather have Jesus. there is anyone here this evening or this morning that does not know you, pray, Lord, that you work in their hearts. Draw them to you. May they come to a saving knowledge of Christ through the understanding of your word, Lord, and doing that miraculous thing in their hearts. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we've had together. This And just guide and direct us this week. This we ask in Jesus' name. You're dismissed. <laughs>